Father, we come to you for this midweek service. We thank you once again for this opportunity to just come and worship you. We thank you, Lord, that we still have that freedom. We pray we continue to have that freedom until you return. Father, we do pray for your, your soon return. We pray even so come, Lord Jesus, that we pray that today might be that day that you bring us home. And Father, we just know that we live in a wicked world, but we know that you're still in control. And Father, that we just pray that the people in this nation might repent and throughout the world and just realize that, that they need to turn to you and you're the only way to heaven. And for Christians to, to stop calling what you call sin, they call it something else, a mistake, or, well, we're all just sinners, or just whatever. They just try to justify sin, and, and they do not see sin in, in the same eyes that you do. And that, that we pray, Father, that they'll be convicted of that and to see that, because there cannot be a revival until people's eyes are open to see what that sin is sin and stop trying to excuse it no matter what it is. And so, Father, we just pray that you bless this service. Be with each and every one. Just uh, thank you for those that are here and listening online. Just use your servant in my way and allow me to uh, be a great soul winner. We pray for those missionaries and pastors out there that are preaching your word out of the King James Bible. May they win many souls. And Father, we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we get started, for those who did not hear my Sunday service, my latest book, the newest book I have out, it's called Meaning of King James Bible Words and Phrases. And this book here, you know, I started doing a sermon on Sunday about the built-in dictionary that's found in the King James Bible. This, this book, you can buy it on Amazon. Uh, just go to Amazon and you, can, and you can find it on my author page or just wherever. But this book describes the built-in dictionary that's within the King James Bible. It helps define its own words and, and so forth. So a lot of that's explained in the book along with some other stuff on proper uh, English and grammar that's used in the King James Bible and so forth. So I appreciate it, uh, the support and help get the word out on that. And it's a very helpful little book. It's six by nine, 213 pages, and has over 2,500 words to find. So it's it's a handy little book for, especially for somebody that's a new Christian, recently saved, that type of thing. So that, you know, don't really know much about the Bible or, or anything like that. So, all right, we're going to continue with our uh, study here now. So we're still looking at Zechariah. This be Zechariah part 39. This should conclude... Our study, we should be able to finish it up today. So, we're going to be in uh, Zechariah, uh, like I said, it's be Zechariah part 39. We're going to pick it up in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 17. So, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 17. And we saw last week how that all the nations, we saw in verse 16, that they'll have to come to Jerusalem. In verse 16 it says, And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember I said that the Feast of Tabernacles, the, the Jewish feast, that it pointed the people to the millennium. That was the purpose. All the feasts had a purpose to point to something. You know, the, the rapture, the, the Jesus is the Passover lamb, whatever it may be. And the, the Feast of Tabernacles was the millennium. And I think that's one reason why, you know, the millennium applies just as much to the Gentiles as it does the Jewish people. So, you know, that may be why all of them have to go. But anyway, we looked at that last week. So let's pick it up in verse 17. So Zechariah chapter 14, verse 17. And it shall be that whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. So God says that those who refuse to go to Jerusalem for the feast of tabernacles and worship Jesus, who is the King and Lord of hosts, then God will withhold rain from them. So we see even in a time with Jesus physically ruling and reigning here on earth from Jerusalem, then you will have people who refuse to get saved, saved and worshiped him and worship him. You know, just as they did when Jesus was walking, people would flat out reject him. But, I mean, here during the millennium, I mean, there's absolutely going to be no, no doubt. I mean, he's going to be physically ruling with a rod of iron that, you know, it's, when he came the first time, he came as a Savior. The second time here, he comes as a king. So, you know, 
he's definitely clearly the ruler. There's no doubt that who he is, that, you know, and so forth. But yet people still are just, even with Satan locked up and so forth, and then just because of the sinful nature that, that people are born with, then there's still going to be people that just refuse to go and get saved and just refuse to, to, to worship. So they do not want to have to go and, and go to Jerusalem to worship him. But God will not allow outright rebellion by these people, and he will also withhold rain from them. You know, as I said, you know, there's there's very little, you know, you're not going to have the re outright rebellion that you, you see nowadays, you know, people doing, rebelling in the streets, stuff like that, rioting and so forth. You know, God knows their hearts, and so, you know, he's, he's going to put a stop to this stuff. You know, you're not going to have, you know, one of the things he's going to do is withhold rain from them. Now, we know that without rain, the crops will not grow, and the people will soon have no food. You know, much of the nation for recent times has, you know, been suffering from a lack of rain, and so the crops haven't been growing that well. You know, so you know that you understand. And the thing is, that crops always grow a lot better from God's rain than they do from, you know, you just water it with a garden hose or, or whatever it may be. And so, you know, without that crops growing, of course, we're not going to be able to eat. You know, everybody thinks, well, I'll just go to Walmart or I'll go to the local grocery store or whatever it may be, supermarket or something. Yeah, but where do you think all that food comes from? It comes from the farmers or whoever to grow these things. Well, you know, if they don't have any rain, then the stores are not going to have it. You know, so, you know, we it's important you have that rain. Now, as I said, this is, this is important as most likely all people will be vegetarians during the millennium. You know, so in, in a lot of ways, it's going to be even more important then than it is now. You know, nowadays... You know, there are still some vegetarians, but, you know, a lot of people, you know, they'll go eat meat, whatever, you know, beef, chicken, pork, whatever it may be. And so they'll eat all, the, you know, meat along with it and stuff. So it's like, okay, well, we can at least maybe try to eat. But of course, even the cattle, you know, they eat the, the crop. So, you know, eventually even they're going to die off or something if they don't have any food. But, but during the millennium, I believe, you know, the animals, we, we know that they're going to be, you know, all buddies with us. And, you know, you can have pet tigers, whatever, lions, and, you know, snake, children will play with snakes, the serpents, and so forth, and, you know, the, the, the asp, and, and um, so forth like that, so, you know, more than likely, I, I just don't think that they'll probably be eating meat during, the, you know, the millennium, so, you know, it's going to be, that's even more important that you have that rain, because that's your only food, I mean, you have no other sources to eat with, so, now, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 18, and if the family of Egypt go not up, and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast or tabernacles. Now God specifically mentions Egypt here, that if they do not go up to Jerusalem to, to worship Jesus, then they will be hit with a plague. Now it seems to indicate this plague comes after they still refuse to come up, even after the rain is withheld from them. You know, it, it may not be, but it seems that, you know, the, the rain's withheld there in verse 17. And then now it talks about in verse 18, and, and it specifically talks about Egypt here. So, so you know, after the rain's withheld, then this plague will come. You know, now, we are not told why Egypt is specifically mentioned. It may be because they were Israel's first major enemy, or because Egypt may think that they can still survive even without rain since they have the Nile River, and even today, rely more on it for their crops than they, than they do actual rain. You know, so, you know, we're not really, you know, it could be one of those things that God's trying to show them, look, even you guys need the rain or whatever, that, you know, I'll, I'll dry up that river, I'll do, you know, whatever, that, that uh, you know, we don't really know why, like I said, maybe it's just because of what they represented as the, as the first enemy, you know, or something, but, in any case, you know, Egypt is specifically mentioned that. Now, obviously, that shows you that Egypt will be there during the millennium, just like Israel. You know, so that's two nations that you know for sure that will be there. You know, whether the United States of America is, you know, so forth or whoever, then, you know, we don't really know. But but God may be, may be saying that he can destroy that just as he did when he had Moses turn it into blood. You know, remember, you know, that could be the plague that, you know, he had that plague when he had the 10 plagues hit Egypt, when the Pharaoh refused to let Israel go. Then one of the things he did is he turned the Nile River into blood. You know, in fact, that was the, the first plague. And so, 
you know, he could do the same thing. When you necessarily have to dry it up. I mean, if you just turn it all into blood, you cannot use that water for it. I mean, it's not water, so you can't use it for anything. So, but the exact plague is never mentioned, so it could be something else. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be turns it into blood. Or like I said, whatever this plague is, is something. But God clearly says that He will smite the heathen who do not come to the feast or tabernacles with the same plague. You know, because it says, and if the family of Egypt go not up, and then uh, further on, then it says, wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up. You know, so now the heathen, obviously the Egyptians would be your heathen too, you know, especially if they're being disobedient. You know, the heathen are the unsaved, you know, they're, they're the, the wicked ones and so forth. But, you know, as a rule, it was also referring usually to the Gentiles, you know, first, because, you know, Jews were God's chosen people and in theory were the Christian, you know, so-called saved people at the time. You know, they weren't really Christians in the story, but they were believers. And then, um, you know, obviously there was, there was Gentile believers, but as a whole, the nations were wicked and, you know, they were considered the heathen. So, you know, it could refer to be simply just saying that the Egyptians are the heathen, or it might be referring to all the heathen, you know, from all the nations as well, you know, that, that come not to the Feast of Tabernacles. But we know that by the time the millennium ends, that the number of unsaved will be as the number of the sand of the sea. So as the years go by, it will probably not just be a few who refuse to go, but many people. You know, so whoever, you know, like I said, it's, it, obviously it's got to be more than just Egypt. There's other nations. There's, um, you know, because I mean, here in verse 17, it was talking about all those that refused to come up. You know, it, it said family, it says all the families of the earth. You know, it didn't say just those of Egypt. So, you know, we know that as far as the rain being withheld, that certainly refers to all nations versus uh, the plague is definitely Egypt. Now, whether it applies to anybody else or not. But again, you know, whatever that plague is, you know, it's something that, uh, you know, these people, God's just not going to tolerate. You will come up to worship me. You know, I will withhold your rain. You know, and it also shows you that during the millennium, you know, obviously you're still going to have to have rain too. The fact that he could withhold it shows that it's still needed. He doesn't go back to like he did prior to, to when Adam and Eve sinned, when he watered the garden with the mist out of the ground or anything like that. You know, he's still rain and, you know, everything like that is still the way we have it today. You know, we still get our rain. We still get the, need the crops to grow and stuff, you know. And obviously this is referring to people that were born during the millennium. You know, they were born in their natural bodies. You know, the people that first go in there, they're in their glorified bodies. So, you know, obviously they don't need to eat and the rain doesn't affect them and so forth. You know, and obviously they're also not going to be sinning and refusing to go worship Jesus. But it just shows you how many people will be rebelling that were that will refuse to go up there for that feast of tabernacles. That, as I said, by the end of the, the, the millennium, it clearly says as the number of the people of the sand and the sea rebel against Jesus. So, you know, there's clearly, you know, if they're, they're probably a lot of those same ones that were refusing to go to the feast of tabernacles. Let's look at verse 19. So chapter, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 19. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So we see in this verse here, it clearly does tell you that that plague, that not only withholding of the, of the rain from all nations, but the plague will also affect not just Egypt, but all the nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So any of those, any of the, you know, with nations that refuse to come to Jerusalem to worship Jesus and keep the Feast of Tabernacles, then as I said, he will withhold the rain and the plague will be the punishment of not only Egypt, but all those nations that do so. Now this feast is obviously very important to Jesus as is a lack of worship to him. Now exactly why, you know, Scripture doesn't tell us exactly why he, he still wants everybody to come and, you know, necessarily celebrate this feast or why, like I said, why the temple gets rebuilt and some of that stuff. You know, those are some of the things that Scripture doesn't tell us. We'll just have to trust God and, and when we get there, then we'll find out. Or whatever. But it's just kind of interesting. But it just shows you that, you know, all the nations will be punished with this plague. You know, so it's it's not just... Egypt, and as I said, why he specifically speaks of Egypt, and it might be just because Egypt was kind of the first main empire and, you know, world empire type thing, and it was the first evilness or whatever. I mean, you had Babylon, you know, under um, Nimrod and so forth, but I mean, as far as 
kind of like a, you know when the nations were going along and you know so it's kind of like a more modern one or whatever you want to say and you know they were the first ones that were like the main enemy of, of Israel so you know I'm not sure exactly like I said but it might have something to do with that as being representative of the enemies of Israel you know they were the first one so it's kind of you know there are other places in scripture where God talks about comparing Israel with Egypt and, and their sins and stuff, just like, you know, Babylon gets you compared with in the New Testament and so forth. But let's look at uh, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 20. In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bulls before the altar. So during the millennium, even the basic things of people, such as even the bells on the horses, will be concentrated for Jesus and will be considered holy. The bells of horses will have the words holiness under the Lord written on them to show they are set apart for God. A similar phrase, holiness to the Lord, was placed on the mitre that was placed on Aaron's forehead and later other high priests. The high priest was a type of Jesus and was set apart as holy and now we see all things are considered holy for the Lord during the millennium. You know, there were certain things that were considered holy by the, the, the Israelite priests and, and different things connected to that with the worship. But, you know, here it seems that, you know, all these things that when they come up to the Feast of Tabernacles, all these things they're going to have are going to be considered holy under the Lord. So let's take a quick look at uh, Exodus chapter 28. Look at verses 36 through 38. So Exodus chapter 28. Verses 36 and 38. I want to just show you about the uh, Arianic priesthood there where they had this holiness here. So, so Exodus chapter 28, verses 36 through 38. And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold and grave upon it, like the engravings of a signet. Holiness to the Lord. And thou shalt put it on a blue lace, that it may be upon the mitre, upon the forefront of the mitre it shall be. And it shall be upon Aaron's forehead, that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things, which the children of Israel shall hallow in all their holy gifts. And it shall be always upon his forehead, that they may be accepted before the Lord. So we see in this verse, in the verse, that the pots in the Lord's house will also be considered holy. You know, nothing around Jesus is considered just ordinary anymore. These pots are, are compared to the bowls before the altar. And the bowls used before the altar were considered holy, and now so are even the pots that are used. So as I said, it seems like during the millennium, anything that even has any kind of connection to the worship of Jesus is going to be considered holy. That, that uh, You know, we saw there with, with um, the verses in Exodus, how, you know, things were, were um, you know, they were made of pure gold, you know, it was a plate of pure gold, and, you know, engraved upon it, engravings of signet holiness to the Lord, and so forth, that, that, you know, remember, gold represents purity, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, it's that yellow color, and, and um, you know, deity, you know, represents deity, you know, purity, you know, white, but, you know, gold is that represents deity, and, um, you know, so we see that, that, you know, but just seems that whatever anything that's connected to the worship, certainly of, of Jesus, is going to be considered holy. All right, let's look at the, the final verse here. So look at Zechariah chapter 14, verse 21. So Zechariah chapter 14, verse 21. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and see therein, and in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. So the final verse of Zechariah continues from where verse 20 left off by saying that every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. In the days of the priests, only those things for the priests were considered holy as it was the priests who were set apart for God. But now all Israelites are priests for the Lord, so that even all the pots in all of Jerusalem and Judah are considered holy for the Lord. 
You know, the, the people that come to the Jerusalem for the Feast of the Tabernacles to offer sacrifices will use these pots to seethe, which means to boil, so to see their boil the sacrifice. And since now all pots are holy and set apart for God. So they'll, they'll boil, they'll, they'll, it sounds like they'll, you know, they'll end up, you know, they can just stop and, you know, beat anybody's house. We need to use your pots and stuff like that, you know, to boil these uh, or seed, you know, the sacrifice in. Since, you know, all the pots will now be holy and set apart for God. So it doesn't matter. You don't have to necessarily go to, well, I need to go to the temple and then here we'll, we'll give you certain pots. That all the pots in, in Jerusalem will be considered holy because, you know, all the people, all the Israelites are going to be, gonna, it's going to finally be the way it was meant to be, where all of them are going to be, you know, like the priesthood, uh, you know, doing that. I was remember that's how originally the whole nation of Israel was supposed to have been, but because of their sin, then it just turned out just to be the tribe of Levi. Levi. But um, you know, the whole nation was intended to have been priests. And that's basically what's going to happen now. And so, you know, everybody's pots throughout that whole city of Jerusalem will be considered holy. So, you know, pair, but it sounds like that, you know, though people get, you know, be borrowing these things. They won't necessarily be bringing their own, it sounds like. It sounds like they'll be bringing you know, borrowing other people's pots and so forth. You know, especially at this time, remember, you know, that's how the early church was. That, you know, you had some extra, you let people use it and so forth. You know, nowadays, you know, people, it's always mine, mine, mine type thing. But, you know, that doesn't seem that's going to be that way during, during the millennium here. But the sacrifices at this time will not save anyone any more than they did in Old Testament times. You know, they are simply for a memorial. As I said, all of Israel is now considered holy, whereas before it was just the temple. You know, so it used to be the, the tabernacle and then later on the temple. It was the things in there that were holy. It wasn't necessarily everything in Jerusalem or this, that. You know, there was a lot of things that were not. So, you know, it was just certain things. But now it's not going to just be the temple, you know, or something. It's going to be the whole, all of, all of Jerusalem. But as I said, they'll be bringing you know, using these pots to boil their own sacrifices in or see them. And as I said, I don't really understand why they still have these sacrifices, but for whatever reason they do. And, but as I said, it's just going to be a memorial, you know, understanding of what Jesus did as our Passover lamb, our sacrifice that, you know, it's not going to save the people, you know, these people that come there, they're not saved, you know, by them offering their sacrifice, they're not going to get saved any more than people did in Old Testament days that they still have to be washed in the blood of Jesus and receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. You know, they need to realize that they're a sinner and that they need a Savior and then call upon Jesus to save them. You know, so it's just going to be simply a memorial. But, you know, everything is ho it's still holy in the way you're doing it. You know, you're doing it as this is a holy memorial. So, you know, it, you know this is something to be taken seriously and so forth. But the first concludes by saying that no longer would a Canaanite be in the house of the Lord of hosts. Now God told the Israelites to remove and destroy the Canaanites as they were very wicked people. You know, if you read throughout the story of, you know, when Israel left Egypt and when they're 40 years in the wilderness and, and then even with the, when Joshua went in there with the people, then, you know, the Canaanites, they were a long time wicked people and they, they were, you know, God was, you know, told them to go around and destroy them. You know, they were, they were unclean. You know, during the millennium, God will no longer allow anything unclean into his presence, which the Canaanite represents. The wickedness of these people will be removed forever. You know, and remember, there were certain times that God would say, you know, somebody <laughs> was not allowed into the, to the uh, temple, you know, down to like, you know, the grandchildren or to like the fifth generation or something like that, depending on, excuse me, the people, like say the Moabites or different ones. I can't remember them all off the top of my head, but there are certain ones that were only allowed into, you know, that, you know, even up to one, I think down to like 10 generations that was not allowed to go in there, you know? So, you know, even if that person was, you know, same eighth generation, it doesn't matter because of certain things, God was still not going to allow them in there. And the Canaanites were one of these people that were not allowed to go in there that, you know, remember uh, Rahab, you know, the, the harlot there that uh, helped the two spies there with Joshua, then, you know, she was said to be a Canaanite. And, 
you know, she got saved, but, you know, she still would have been the same way, though. She still would have probably not been allowed, you know, plus being a, a female anyway, a woman. So, but, um, you know, whatever it is, you know, either it's just literally they're not going to be any more any kind of invites even close to being uh, descended from them or whatever, but they're not going to be in that house anymore. And, you know, or also, could, you know, just the evilness that they represent that, you know, God's that, that it's, it's done. It's not going to be like before where the, the Israelites oftentimes desecrated the temple, you know, they'd go and do unholy things in there or, you know, offer sacrifice they weren't supposed to or do different things. You know, that, that stuff's done because, the uncleanness is just not going to be allowed anymore by Jesus during the millennium. You know, so that wickedness will be gone. You know, as I said, Jesus is going to be ruling with that rod of iron. And, and, and he's just, you know, he's going to put a stop to things. And things are going to be holy during this time period. So the book of Zechariah has many prophecies for Israel that have yet to be fulfilled. This shows that God's promises will always be kept and that he is not through with Israel. You know, I've said that before. Many people say, oh, well, the church has replaced Israel, you know, their replacement theology, they call that and so forth. But, you know, here's a good example. Zechariah is, is clearly shows that God is not through with Israel. You know, most of this stuff, you know, a lot of these things are all future. You know, they're, they're, you know there are some things that have passed, you know, dealt with the first coming and so forth. But a lot of this still deals with the Great Tribulation and the Millennium. Well, that's all future to even to us. So, you know, and, and it clearly shows that God is not through with his people, that he protects them, gets them through the, the tribulation there. And then, you know, they're ruling and reign with him during the millennium and, you know, so forth. So that, you know, God is clearly not, not through with Israel. But we pray for the soon return of Jesus and the fulfillment of the soon coming millennium when we can worship Jesus in person. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. You know, you heard me in my prayer earlier. I said that, that um, you know, I pray that, you know, tonight would be a good night for the rapture or whatever. That, that uh, you know, we want that. We should be praying for that soon return. We should be looking for that return of Jesus. You know, there's a lot of people, a lot of professing Christians that they just do not look for Jesus. They don't care. You know, they don't necessarily want Jesus to come back. They're too busy. You know, they might be saved, but they're too busy living in their sins enjoying them for that season versus, uh, you know, wanting to, you know, have Jesus return. They don't want Jesus return because they know what they're doing right now. It's not living properly. So they're like, whoa, we don't want him to come now. That wouldn't be good. But we need to be, you know, living right and looking for Jesus. And we need to be praying for the Jewish people that their eyes will be opened up to realize that God is not through with them and, and that, um, you know, he has big plans for them. And so, you know, we need, we need to, we need to, you know, try to push stop to this replacement theology that, you know, the Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church is uh, greatly behind. They're the ones that basically, you know, pushed and started it all. So, you know, not only are you supporting false Roman Catholic doctrine, but you're, you're going against God's word. And, but, so we see, you know, like I said, the book of Zechariah, it has many prophecies in it that, that um, you know, it's one of those books that has, you know, it's, it, it's a, a lot of things that haven't been fulfilled yet. But that concludes our study on the book of Zechariah. And more than likely, um, we'll probably be starting through the book of Daniel uh, next week or so. So we'll see how that goes in the Lord's one. We'll see what the, the Lord leads. But it, I think at this time, it'll probably be the, the book of Daniel. But that, as I said, that concludes our study on Zechariah. And so let's, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time you've given us to just study your, your um, word that you have there in Zechariah. And, and it, we rejoice and see that you clearly show that you're not through with Israel. And you do keep your word and your promises that you promise to always be there for Israel and to, to keep them around and so forth. And, and this book, uh, Zechariah, clearly shows that that, uh, that will be fulfilled, that those things during the millennium will see that more through the great tribulation and the millennium. And that, Father, we, we rejoice that Jesus will be ruling with that rod of iron in the millennium, and he will not tolerate the sin and rebellion, open rebellion that we see going on in our world today. And so, Father, we just pray that if there's someone not saved, that today might be the day of their salvation. And for those that are Christians or profess to be Christians, that they'll get right with you, Lord, get rid of their sins, and that uh, 
many people most, you know, realize the importance of that Israel is still for you and that they'll be obedient to you, Lord, and that they'll look for your soon return. That I know I, for one, I, I want you to return as soon as you can, Lord, that, you know, yes, I'd like to see more people saved, but Lord, you know what, what, what's, what's right, what's not. But at the same time, this world is just getting so wicked, Lord, that, uh, you know, anybody that truly loves you, Lord, does not love the sin that's going on. In it. And so this world should not be their home, that they should be wanting to return at, at your, your return so that you might, people might be able to be with you. And so, Father, we thank you that you allowed us to study uh, about Zechariah. We pray that if we go into Daniel, that you'll be with your servant. Give me the understanding of that book as well, as that's another difficult book, just like Revelation and some of the other ones. And so, Father, we just pray that you bless all those that are listening here and online and just bless the rest of the week and just keep everyone healthy and safe, put a hedge around us, and just uh, use your servant in a mighty way. And we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.